Hello everyone, this is the Circuit Circuit Python Weekly meeting for Monday, April 22nd, 2024. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things Circuit Python. I'm Dan and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on Circuit Python. You might ask, what is Circuit Python? It's a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join that server anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. The meeting is typically on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes document, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the at sign CircuitPythonista's Discord role. Um, there's a notes document that accompanies the meeting and the recording. Uh, we encourage you to contribute to this document beforehand uh, by adding um, hug reports and status reports and things to talk about. Uh, and it's also in the pin notes. A link to this uh, is in the pin notes of the CircuitPython dev channel. So you can go up and look at the pin icon, click on the pin icon in the Discord channel and be able to see it. The meeting tends to run about 30 to 60 minutes. After the meeting, we post the link for the next meeting notes minutes in the pinned uh, notes that I just mentioned. This meeting is held in five parts, community news, state of CircuitPython, Bl libraries and Blinka, hug reports, status updates, and in the weeds, and I'll explain each of those sections as we get to them. So first, uh, we'll start with community news, and I'll take a timestamp in the notes document. Um, And uh, I just mentioned that these items come from the Python and Microcontrollers newsletter, which is published weekly by Adafruit, edited by um, Anne, who's uh, often in this channel but isn't here today. And um, we usually pick out just a few items that are kind of the most pertinent and interesting. So I will start uh, reading um, the first item which is using ESP now on CircuitPython 903. Um, Circuit ESP now is a connectionless Wi-Fi communication protocol defined by Espresso. So it's just, it's implemented in Espresso. I don't know that any other Wi-Fi chips implement, have software to implement this, but it's very easy to use and doesn't require connections and things like that. So there are some links in the notes document about how to use um, ESP now. And I encourage you to look at that or look at the newsletter if you'd like to see more details. Let me fix up a couple of the links in here. All right. Um, next is that um, last week, uh, CircuitPython 904 and 91 Beta 1 were released. Um, 904 is the latest bug fix release of the stable 90X line of CircuitPython. And um, 910 beta 1 is a beta for not CircuitPython 910, which has a number of additions and uh, a small number of changes from 990. Uh, it's updated various things internally, and it's in pretty good shape. I encourage you to try the beta if you are able to. Um, the next item is uh, about a web-based editor. It's called CircuitPython Online IDE. That's uh, developed by URFDVW in GitHub, also known as Riverwang. And there are links in there. This is a nice um, uh, IDE you can use, which you can use in your browser, which can talk to the CircuitPy drive after you give it permission, and also has a REPL window. So take a look like that. And at that, there's a it's a new 2.0. Uh, version and there's a YouTube intro which I watched that's very brief and explains things straightforwardly. So 
as I mentioned, um, these items come from the Python or micro Microcontroller's weekly newsletter. Um, it's emailed every Monday. Uh, the archives are in a link that's given in the um, notes document. I encourage you to subscribe if you'd like, and I also encourage you to uh, submit items for the newsletter, which you can do a variety of ways. You can email cpnews at adafruit.com. You can tag a post with a hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon, Blue Sky, or um, X, and uh, or you can submit a pull request to the uh, weekly newsletter um, GitHub repo for the file that's the current draft. Any of those things are fine, however, whatever works for you. All right. Um, now we'll go on to um, the state of CircuitPython uh, library, the libraries in Blinka. Um, this is a quantitative overview, overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project, separate some are um, qualitative status updates. We'll talk about the project overall and then separately discuss the core libraries and Blinka. So first overall, um, in the last week, uh, there were, um, let me take a timestamp here actually. Uh, overall in the past week, there were 22 pull requests merged by 14 authors. Uh, some new authors I haven't seen before, are Michael Dye, Kevin Tritz, uh, T. Comdi, Teku, Tekunology. Um, yes, those are the ones I've seen. Anyway, there were 14 authors, there were eight reviewers, and there were 10 issues closed by seven people and 11 opened by 11 people. So pretty stable in terms of the number of issues. Um, in the core uh, section, let me take a timestamp. Um, that's the CircuitPython core, the actual CircuitPython interpreter. There were eight pull requests merged. Um, there were three reviewers of those pull requests. We have 22 open pull requests. A lot of them are a draft. Uh, they're awaiting one thing or another. And then there are some things that are awaiting um, uh, being put in shortly. Uh, in the core, there were four issues closed by three people and two opened by two people. We have 679 open issues. For in the Adafruit Circuit Python core repo, uh, we have milestones, which is a way of us marking uh, kind of the calendar for getting certain things done, not in terms of dates, but in terms of like prior priorities and uh, which releases certain things are going to get fixed for. There are ten. There are two open issues in the 10.00 milestone. Those are deferred until we start working on 10.00. Um, there are zero open issues for A2X which we're not going to um, work on anymore unless something really serious came up. There are zero open issues for the 90x milestone, so we don't have any outstanding uh, bugs for 90x right now. There are zero open issues for the 910 uh, milestone, but there are 31 open issues for the 9xx milestone, and a lot of those issues we'd like to fix for 910. There are 22 issues on that have to do with libraries. There are 602 issues that are long-term that uh, are either enhancements or, or uh, bugs that don't need immediate fixing. There are nine support issues where we're awaiting further um, information from someone, or it seems like more of a support issue than a bug. And there are 14 issues that are open due to awaiting, awaiting something for a third party. And one issue uh, was recently created and hasn't been assigned a milestone yet. So we'll triage that into one of the milestones soon. Okay, uh, now we'll move on to the um, libraries section. And um, Tim, foamy guy, were you able to read that? Yeah, you get scrolled back to the right spot. There we are. Okay, so this section covers all of the CircuitPython libraries, all of which are uh, available on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython uh, underscore, and then the name of whatever the library is. Uh, across all those libraries this week, we had 14 pull requests merged by 10 uh, authors. A couple of the names on the author side that were uh, newer or at least um, less familiar to me were uh, Dan CT12, 
Michael Dye, Kevin Tritz, uh, T Comedy, uh, T Kunology uh, are the ones that again were newer or um, you know less familiar to me. So those folks might be uh, newer contributors or less frequent contributors. Thanks to them as well as all of our other more frequent contributors. Um, across those 14 pull requests, we had uh, eight reviewers for the week. So thank you to our eight reviewers. Um, in the pull requests that were merged, the oldest one was 150 days, and the newest one uh, is back down to just one day. That leaves us after the week with 70 open pull requests. The oldest uh, one is a draft at 613 days, and the newest one is just one day. Um, over the past seven days, we had five issues closed by four people with four new issues opened up by four people. And that leaves us with a total of 741 open issues across all those libraries. Uh, and there are six of those that are labeled as good first issues, uh, which you can find over on circuitpython.org slash contributing. Um, that is the place where you should head if you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things. Uh, on that page, you're going to find a list of open PRs as well as open issues. Um, if you are looking to contribute, that's the place we always like to point folks towards. Uh, in particular, reviewing tends to be uh, the gr a great place for folks to get started. So take a look at the list of open PRs. Find something that is either uh, of interest to you or that you've got the hardware for uh, or just a, uh, an interest in looking into. And you can click through, take a look at the change in that PR. Um, try it out. If you do have the hardware, leave a comment on GitHub, uh, just letting us know, you know, uh, that you took a look, that you tried it out, what you found, um, anything like that. And then uh, once you get comfortable with that, we can get you leveled up to leave official reviews if that is something that you'd like to do as well. Uh, and then on the actual contribution side, if you'd like to start getting your hands dirty with some code, you can uh, take a look on that same page, circuitpython.org slash contributing. If you just click over to the issues, uh, you'll then see a list of all the open issues, which you can filter using a drop down that's near the top of the page, uh, which is how you can filter those down to the, uh, the issues identified as good first issues, which are intended to be ones that are uh, identified as kind of good for folks who don't necessarily have as much experience. So if you're new to CircuitPython or if you, um, you know, haven't used uh, Git or GitHub as much, if you don't necessarily know the process, those are the ones kind of identified to be um, best for that. And uh, the other good piece of advice I have if you are in that situation is to join us uh, on Discord uh, in the CircuitPython dev channel and the help with CircuitPython channel. There are folks around all the time who are more than willing to help you if you are trying to get started uh, contributing or reviewing. So uh, never hesitate to ask there. We also do have guides for contributing with Git and GitHub uh, to help you out on that front too. Uh, next up, I will tell you about the uh, PyPy stats for the week. Uh, we did have 161,153 downloads across all of the 326 libraries listed on PyPy. The top 10 list is here in the notes doc if you'd like to take a look at that. And uh, the updated and, uh, excuse me, the new libraries for the week are uh, the uh, ADG 72X, uh, and then updated libraries are RSA and the template engine. Uh, this week. And that's what we've got in library land. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Tim. Okay. Next up is uh, the Blinkist section, uh, which uh, maker Melissa will read. Hello. Uh, the Blinka is our circuit Python compatibility layer for uh, MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. This week we had zero pull requests merged. We currently have five open pull requests amongst all the different repositories. There was one closed issue by one person, five open by five people, leaving a net of 91 open issues. There were 12,822 PyPI downloads in the last week, 10,219 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we're at 133 boards that we support. All right, thank you very much, Melissa. All right, the next section is Hug Reports. So what's Hug Reports? It's a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start as a host, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you're text only or missing the meeting, I'll just read your notes when I get to them in the list. So uh, first of all, I'll, as I said, I'll start. Take a timestamp. Uh, thanks to Foamy Guy, Justin, and Anecdata for um, working on um, various examples 
uh, for Adafruit requests and pull requests and so forth. There's a lot of stuff going on there that's really great to show people the best way to use things like Adafruit requests. And I, I guess there are also some examples for some other network libraries at the current time. Um, thanks to Bill ADAT, who, who continues to find uh, little annoyances about CircuitPython and suggest fixes or submit pull requests, such as like, oh, oh there are con there are terminal control sequences in bootout.txt. Like that was a simple, nice thing that was fixed recently by Bill ADAT. And thanks to um, AT Makers Bill, Bill Binko, for inspiring the creation of the TRRS Trinky, which you may have heard about uh, recently. It was on Desk of it Lady Ada yesterday. It was designed for uh, assistive technology uses, and but it also has a bunch of other uses. Uh, using CircuitPython was assistive technology, for assistive technology was how I got st started working on CircuitPython um, like seven years ago. So it's a very useful thing to work on and it's really suitable for that also. All right, uh, next up I'll read C. Grover's uh, contribution. Thanks to Jeffler for providing inspiration for the CG35 calculator project as well as their stellar work on Udecimal and Utrig libraries. Um, next is DJ Devon 3. Uh, I'll read theirs. Thanks to Justin for changing all 25 of the Adafruit request Wi Fi examples to use with statements. Yeah, for, to use um, context management, which is a, a nice way to clean up uh, instead of having to do things like close explicitly. And uh, next up, is um, Foamy Guy. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, hard reports for me this week. Thanks to DJ Devin 3 for working on some requests examples, uh, especially when Pilot and some of the other um, checks add difficulty to the process. Thank you to Justin for updating many of the request examples to use the with context manager, as mentioned. Uh, and also another one to Justin for sharing some improvements to a PR that I submitted that adds support for the files argument uh, to request, uh, uh, request dot post rather. Uh, and then thank you to Bear, uh, Tyeth, and Fede2 all in Discord, uh, who all offered up help and insight on things that I was working on during live streams over the weekend. Much appreciated to all of them. Thanks. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, next up I'll read uh, uh, Jeff's, uh, he's out uh, today from the meeting. Uh, he gives a group hug. And next up is Jerry. Yeah, hi. Uh, where to go? Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks to Michael Dye, uh, Lady Ada, and Inu Dan for the quick response uh, to Michael Dye's PR, and and then getting it released with the update to the uh, RFM 69 library to handle the surprise new chip ID. Right, right. This was very an interesting thing where uh, it turns out some modules that we've been buying now have suddenly decided to have a new chip ID and the library was not aware of that. So thank, thanks especially to Michael Dye for finding that. And next up is Maker Melissa. I just had a group hug for everyone. Thank you. Okay, and uh, next up is Scott. He's out. And I nope, I'm, I just got to my desk, Dan. Oh, great. Okay, I just saw you. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, hug to Moto Timo for meeting up with me last week at the Zephyr conference. And also to the Renode team for helping me uh, get started with Renode. All right, terrific. Okay, uh, next up is uh, status updates. Right, I'm going to type a timestamp without holding down the shift key. There we go. Uh, status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I'll start and we'll go through the list alphabetically. When I call on you, can take a couple of minutes to talk, talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you will be doing up until the next meeting. There's also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion arises that becomes too long for status updates, we can always move it to the in the weeds section. So I will start as the host and then we'll go alphabetically. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, I released uh, CircuitPython 904 and 910 beta 1 last week. Um, and I'm just continuing to work on 9xx bugs, of which there are still like three dozen or so that we'd like to get fixed. Maybe not all for 910, but uh, more. 
and still working on that. I guess also I could I could say I forgot to say here that I've also I did the um, board definitions for the uh, pixel trinky and the TRS trinky, which I I mentioned already, and working out which of those things. Uh, which are the, what, what modules we can include on those boards because they use SAMD21 and there's not a lot of uh, space available. Okay, next up is uh, C. Grover, and I'll read theirs because it's text only. Um, wrapped up the capacitive touch version of the CG35 retro RPN calculator project and posted the details on Playground. That's the Adafruit Playground, where you can write things that look like learn guides. Replace the original Feather M4 with an ESP32 S3 to accommodate memory requirements and the newest version of CircuitPython. Still scheming to use the wireless capability of the ESP2, ESP32 S3 for something extra like time and temperature feeds from Adafruit I.O. Hate to have it just sitting there longing to communicate with its computational friends. Uh, and then been working on house remodeling the past few weeks and are beginning to see the light, a light at the end of the tunnel. It's been fun watching the contractors and working with them when they allow, learning from their techniques and use of tools. They've been very patient with me and my astute observations. Of course, I saved a few tasks for myself, such as replacing gutter downspouts, upgrading external electrical outbo outlet boxes, and insulating and enclosing HVAC piping. All right, next up is DJ Devon. And I see their text only, so I'll read theirs. Most of my week has been centered around fixing my irrigation system and digging holes. First time I've ever wired up a 220 volt device myself. I'm still alive, so it was a success. Diagnosing electrical panel, relay, and well pump issues has been fun to learn. The Ratio irrigation controller I'm installing next week has a REST API and integration with Home Assistant and other smart devices. As most of you know, I love playing with APIs, so I can't wait to get started on that. Modern irrigation systems are all low voltage, 20 vol 24 volts AC based, so there is little danger in experimenting with new PC designs. I have a lot of ideas on how to make an irrigation diagnostic system even smarter, and might design a PCB for an open source CircuitPython powered irrigation controller in the future. That sounds like an interesting project. Okay, next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thank you. Um, so over the past week, I did a bunch of reviewing and testing of library PRs, uh, mostly in the request library, but there were a few others uh, sprinkled in, like IR Remote and a couple others. I think there was a accelerometer, but I forget which one. Um, I worked on uh, and submitted a, a PR into requests in order to add the files argument uh, for uploading files, which is something that's supported by CPython requests, uh, but was not in the CircuitPython one prior to that. Uh, and then I started exploring the idea of building CircuitPython inside of a Docker container. Uh, I did manage to get successful builds of the Atmel and the Espressive ports, um, and I learned how to copy the actual UF2 file out of the container so it could be flashed onto a device. Um, I am still very new to Docker, so I did this mostly as a learning and practice exercise, uh, but I could, be, I could see it being handy, uh, a handy way to get a build environment spun up quickly um, without having to micromanage installing all of the necessary tools and requirements, uh, as well as being able to work on some of the different ports that have different requirements uh, independently without kind of cross-pollination, so to speak. Um, I didn't think to search the Docker Hub uh, until after I'd already done this, but I did eventually find some prior work from uh, Jeff, uh, Fede2, and a user called Travis Consulting, so a uh, belated hug report to them for publishing their uh, images. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right. Um, next up is uh, Jeff. I'll read uh, his. Still need to check out some problem reports on the SSL Anything PR. That's a PR that uses uh, factors out a lot of code so that you can use SSL on any network connection, any kind of network connection. Investigating whether we can use ESP ADF, that's not ESP IDF, to add MP3 decoding for expressive micros in CircuitPython. It uses RTOS tasks, but our file system code and audio output code are not prepared to be called from task context. So this complicates things. 
Uh, personal stuff, I think I've almost got a GoTech floppy emulator talking to my Xerox 820, which is the third needed peripheral needed to make the main PCB into a working CPM computer. Keyboard and display are the other two things. All right, and next up is Jerry. All right, uh, let's see. So I'm, as some of you know, I'm spending a lot of time trying to update and uh, consolidate the RFM libraries uh, for both the RFM 6.9 and RFM 9X. And lately, I've just been spending a lot of time playing with async I/O, trying to convince myself that it that it works. I mean, it does work, but uh, just trying to really learn how to use it uh, properly and really understand the impact of using it. So, um, but having some success, and especially you know, com making lots of examples, um, probably too many examples, but um, it it helps me understand them anyway. Um, and so, so really the next thing, big thing I need to do is really dig into verifying all the tweakable parameters in the libraries still work properly and probably actually work work better than they did, some of them. Um, particularly on the RFM 9X, there was always issues with, uh, very, with changing the spreading factors. So I wanna make sure that those are, are actually working properly. Um, I'm hoping to have a, you know, a, a, a version ready release you know, real, real soon now, <laughs> we'll see. Um, if anybody wants to play with it, there's a link to it in, in both the uh, RFM 9X and 6.9 libraries. Um, um, otherwise, I, I'm curious if anybody else or anybody is working on trying to actually get LoRaWAN support back into CircuitPython. It hasn't been available for a long time since the, uh, the Things Network went up to version 3. And uh, I know I found a, a real dearth of Python libraries available for LoRaWAN. There's very little support on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I haven't found any really good, good, oh, excuse me, cat's a little excited. Um, so just curious if anybody else is working on, on, on that. Um, and um, then my other big project of the week was to get my um, board of green hardwood stacked and into my woodshed for the winter. Just put up a picture. Oh, where'd it go? Uh, and um, so that's my. Uh, oh, I put the picture. The, um, the picture shows the uh, woodshed. That's only one layer. There's actually two rows there. So get me busy, and uh, my muscles are still recuperating. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jerry. That that is a lot of wood. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up is Justin. Yeah, just getting back on the bandwagon. I've been out for a few weeks. Um, work's been work work's been super busy. Um, so mainly working on some um, requests and connection manager updates. Um, working on the stuff for like the SSL everywhere, um, and then kind of jumped on. I saw uh, from a guy that opened up a PR for um, an issue that I had seen that was out there for being able to. Um, send multi-part and I had a bunch of stuff in the stash and I saw his stuff and kind of tried to open a PR into his to merge it together. And so hopefully we'll come up with something that's in a good state um, with both of those kind of squished together. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. And now we've got here for maker Melissa. Um, so I've been continuing to going through uh, guide feedback and updating some of the older Raspberry Pi related guides. And I also tested out a possible solution for getting the voice bonnet working on the Pi 5, but I didn't have any luck. Okay, thank you. Okay, and finally we'll hear from uh, Scott, also known as Tanut. Hey, thanks Dan. Um, so last week I was away from my desk. I went to the Zephyr Development Summit, uh, also known as the Embedded Online or Embedded Open Source Software Summit, um, put on by the Linux Foundation. It was downtown Seattle. I met a lot of cool folks. Um, so thanks to everybody there. Um, but it did mean that I was kind of like not quite keeping up. So I've got lots of tabs open uh, to look at. Um, I also started a Renode port. Um, Renode is a an emulator for Cortex-M class and RISC-V class, like microcontroller class stuff um, that runs in actions. And I 
decided that the best way to go about it was to make a special port on CircuitPython that basically allows us to have kind of a test harness for running under Renode. So just very simple system on chip models where we have a core, a CPU core, and uh, a UART that we can uh, do output to. The nice thing about doing that is that we could um, use it for running um, like library imports and also seeing traces. Like it's really, e really quick to grab uh, code traces from it, which is really nice. So uh, very interested in that and uh, made it most of the way, but did not actually get it tested yet. Um, the other benefit of a Reno port could be that it's very, very simplified. Um, it could be a good minimal port for us to have. Um, so I, I do want to finish that, but it's not my top priority. Uh, what my top priority is, is actually getting back into ESP BLE work this week. It's a big, bigger task that I've been meaning to kind of get my, stick my teeth into and see how far I can get. Um, I'm around for this week and next week uh, before I go on a road trip with my dad the following week. So I'm going to see how far I can get on the ESP BLE work in the next two weeks and then um, get whatever I have in before I leave and then uh, get up after I get back. Okay, thank you, Scott. Okay, uh, I'm interested in this Renode. Does it have peripherals? Yeah, so it does. And their model, it really is to kind of be able to run um, kind of stock firmware on it, but uh -huh. they don't have great coverage. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm happy to show you more. They, they have this cool command called Renode Run which will, you can give it like a, a, a Renode board name and then an ELF file and it just tries to run it, um, which is awesome. And then it, what it does is it'll log all accesses to memory addresses that it doesn't know about. Um, so you can see that like, oh, like, like I tried the STM port, I tried the NRF port and the SAMD port. And like, I think it was the NRF one was like, it was trying to read like the RTC timer and like couldn't get past that. Um, generally, they don't have great coverage for flash controllers. Um, it's open source, so we could. It's written in C sharp at the core, um, but we could we could add models to it if we wanted to run stock firmware. But mostly, my interest is running. Um, you know, mainly being able able to emulate that we're running on a Cortex M zero. You know, taking a, a binary that's comport compiled for M0 and just running the emulator in that space. That sounds really good. And so that's my, good for like finding storage issues or something that, yeah. Right. So you can, you know, it's easy to, you get a, you can do a, easily capture a full call graph. You can have it like, you know, run an import and then dump memory at some point. Um, and so my thinking was that we'd have a Reno port and we can make different boards where the system on the chip layouts is actually all the same. It's just the CPU core that we would swap out. So we'd be able to run, you know, in a virtual M0, a virtual M4, a virtual RISC-V, um, and it would just have, like, all of the same memory layout and the UART controller. Um, but we'd be able to kind of compare how we perform across um, across CPUs. But there is a caveat in that their, their emulation doesn't account for... Um, their emulation doesn't account for how long instructions take. So um, there is a, a pretty big grain of salt that you have to take as well. OK. All right, well, that's very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, and they, like, they like I, I got them to sit down with me. And like they actually like compiled CircuitPython to try it on their side and, and stuff. So it was really helpful to really get me over the hump of like, I could actually see how it works and, and kind of be tempted by it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, finally, uh, so fi our final section is in the weeds where we have longer discussions of um, things that people just want to discuss or that come, have come out of um, previous discussions. So if you have a we in the weeds item, make sure to put it in beforehand and people can even comment on it in advance. Um, so Justin, do you want to go ahead and start with yours? Yeah, so I was playing with the um, SSL everywhere, um, which required me to throw the Ethernet feather wing on a S3 feather. And during that process, I realized that there was an issue with Connection Manager of being able to share um, two separate pools. Um, and then basically through that, I had remembered a 
um, image um, that Anecdata had shared with like every single version of the WizNet um, known to man um, all running at the same time. And I was looking at code and realizing how does this actually work? And we realized it didn't because the way the socket pool or this fake socket code works for WizNet and the ESP32 spy is there's a call to set interface that is a global variable um, that is set to whatever radio gets passed into it last. Um, and so I wanted to kind of contemplate and I opened up a draft PR to kind of look at it to move the socket code over into a class so you could actually have two of them running at the same time. Um, obviously, this is a much more advanced case. Um, a simple workaround that would work, although I haven't tested it, would be literally just to copy that pool file or that um, socket file multiple times because then each one of those would be imported as a different thing. Is there a different file? And so that global wouldn't be attached. And so just kind of a question of, does this make sense? Um, it would allow the socket pool code to be similar across everything. Um, and yeah, so I'm just kind of opening it up there. Um, you know, there was the one comment, Dan, that you made on this. Um, if it would be a singleton, my issue with that is it actually can't be a singleton um, because if you actually have two, you know, WizNets, then they actually have to be able to run separately. Right. I, yeah, I hadn't realized as people said, okay, you could have multiple. I wasn't thinking about that. I was just thinking that if you want to, if you ask for a second socket pool, it wouldn't give you a second one or something. But it would, yeah, and be, so that's, that's, it would still be a socket pool. It just might complain even if you try to create more than one or something like that. But I, I understand that yeah. that makes sense. And the two things we're talking about are WizNet and ESP32 SPI, right? There isn't a third. Technically, uh, we could update it for Fona as well. Um, I don't know if that works anywhere. I've been updating those with some of the other things I've been doing. Like it would end up being copy and paste and things. So it'd be a little bit hard to fully test um, unless there's someone that knows where, like obviously you guys have the hardware, but I think the struggle is getting us in that works with that. So that would be, that's the only other one that's. Um, right, right. I'm not even sure which Sims work. It's very few people are trying that anymore right now. I mean, this, I, when you, your idea makes sense to me, it makes it because it makes any way of unifying all the networking implementations so that they're, you know, their setup is could be rather different. But once you get past the setup and you have an object or, or you have connection manager that can ask those things about how to do things, um, then that makes sense because then at some point you want to stop worrying about what's the difference between all these things. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, I think it's very worthwhile to pursue. Okay. And then the other kind of question I had on that was like, if it, if you look at the PR, like that I did, I kept the old sockets and then just had it, it created the global instance. And I didn't know if we wanted to do that versus kind of what we did with connection manager and literally just drop support for the old one and have people, if they update the new version. They just have to go change code. Um, if they've already moved to connection manager, it would be seamless for that because it would know it would try to import the new one. Um, and so that wouldn't be an issue. It'd just be people that were updating legacy. And maybe if they're not using connection manager, they're far enough back. It doesn't matter anyway. So I think it's okay yeah. if we make a major version that's a rewrite of the API. Yeah, because people okay. can always use the older version of the library. And then the main thing is if there are any learn guide projects that use that, they need to be updated. But I'm not sure if there are any, if there are any WizNet learn guides, there are probably very few, and there may be none. I'm not even sure. So I think it's okay to do that. Uh, that's what versions are for, basically, is what I'd say. Okay. Um, it doesn't break I don't know. the old library. The old library is available. It's just not, you have, it's a little work to get to it. So. Okay. If, if someone at some point can help and figure out like any open PR will just be dead in the water once, if, once this gets done and merged because file rename, it's in a class, like everything's going to be like the code itself is 
it'll be easy enough to remake it or move it over. But if, you know, I see currently five other open PRs and I don't know if any of these, we want to make sure that they get in mm -hmm. um, next before the socket pool work, just to not make it hard for people to have to deal with all that stuff. So. All right. Yeah. We'll have to just have to take a look and see if those are actually PRs that we want to merge or not. Yeah. So I thought they made a mark comment on it so that he'll go through those. And so like, yeah. And same thing, right? Like I kind of need to open them up, open this PR again from Maine. If there's other changes, just because it'll be really hard to uh, mitigate around that stuff. So. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, thank I you. I think this is very, very worthwhile and it's, it's overdue doing this um, consolidate, this refactoring consolidation and making things work the same. I think that's really, it's a great goal. I really thank you for working on okay. this. Yeah, and docs should be pretty simple because hopefully everything's been updated at this point to use Connection Manager, at which point they should be seamless, but I'll definitely go take a look to see if there's anything that's super legacy that got missed the first time around. Okay, all right, that sounds good. Okay, anybody else have any comments on that particular thing? Um, if not, Foamy Guy, you could go ahead with your item. All right, thanks. Um, this was something we talked a little bit about in the weeds a couple of weeks back. Um, the good first issue labels. We took off all the remaining ones that were on um, type annotations because they weren't weren't really good first issues. Some of them were a lot more complex. The the couple that were left were kind of the gnarly ones. Um, one of the ideas that I had at the time, I don't think it was actually during the meeting, but afterwards was about um, creating display IO based sensor driver library examples, like uh, as an example on a, a lot of Adafruit product pages for any kind of sensor, um, you know, like an accelerometer or a temperature sensor or anything like that, there will almost always be a GIF or a video uh, of an example that's just got like a simple label on the screen and it's updating the label with values from the sensor. And then, uh, you know, the person recording it will either move the sensor around or, or make it hotter or colder or whatever. So you can see those numbers change. Um, my idea was basically uh, making those uh, as good first issues. I think that would be um, kind of like uh, fulfilling, like we talked about before. The type annotations were not necessarily the most fulfilling thing to work on, whereas this gives you something kind of very tangible. You can see it working and you can kind of, um, you know, just uh, really see very clearly and, and, and feel the, the impact of it uh, just when you're looking at it and working on it and stuff like that. So um, my main questions around that are the three questions. Basically, is it okay to start making issues uh, for those? Uh, if so, is there any input on to uh, like what the content of that actual issue post um, should be? And then the last one is, does anybody know if there is a list of libraries somewhere that is broken down by the type of library? So I know in the bundle, they are uh, split up into the drivers and the helpers. But if there's any place, um, it, which, and I kind of feel like I've seen this before, but I can't think of where, uh, yeah, a place where they're broken. OK, perfect. Yeah, because that will make it a lot easier to try to automate that if I can kind of for loop through that and um, use GH or something to create the issues. So um, that's really good. Thank you for that. Um, so then, yeah, is it is cleaned up a little bit or made more consistent or something? But yeah, I get the link that I just posted. Um, Perfect. I had a question about display IO. If you make these examples, maybe you said this already because uh, I was for looking for that link. Um, if you make a display IO example, is there an issue with the library then having requirements that are not that are requirements for the example but not for the um, actual library? Yeah. Good question. I think I mean for one thing we have um, I don't know which all the libraries that have this are, but I know at least some of the libraries have a thing called like optional requirements that effectively solves that problem by putting any requirements that are only used by one specific thing, whether it's an example or a certain specific feature within the library, um, it can put those requirements in there and then it's up to you to install those if you're using that feature or that example. Um, secondarily, I would say in my mind what makes the most sense for these is uh, to try to get them to run on as large a swath of boards as possible. And to that end, I would say it makes the most sense to just use 
um, board.display, the built-in display. So rather than uh, initializing any particular display, which would definitely require a driver or something like that, instead we just go with the built-in uh, board display and then the one uh, other dependency basically would become uh, Adafruit display text in order to be able to create that label to put on the screen. So um, yeah, that would be the one as, as far as I can think off the top of my head, at least, I think that's the only kind of um, additional requirement that this example would need. Mm -hmm. Well, this sounds good. It, it brings up another thing again about how these examples are all great, but they're just in the library and most people don't know to look in the library for examples. Right. I'm yeah, and I mean, for what it's worth, I'm 100% pro uh, if these come into existence and start start existing, I'm 100% pro adding them to the learn guides for those particular products as well. I mean, if you go pull up a, a, an accelerometer or a temperature sensor on the store page and you click through to its learn guide, it will bring you to a CircuitPython example that will uh, typically just print values from that uh, sensor, which of course, if you do have a built-in display, that is gonna print into the serial output on the display. Um, but I would love it if there was one extra section right there on that page where those examples are at that was like, hey, here's the same, uh, the same driver and effectively the same code, just with a display IO label as well, um, and updating it there. That way folks could kind of use that as a launch point for their own projects. Because one of the things I think I've seen over and over is folks trying to set that up and then coming into the help with channel um, with display text code that's not quite right. They'll either initialize the label every time in the main loop or they'll be having trouble figuring out how to get the, the, the label text to update. So um, yeah, I, I'm definitely also fully on board with adding these examples or embedding them into those guide pages as a, another place for them to be visible to the public and hopefully helpful for people uh, and easier to find. That sounds great. Yeah. I, I agree with that. And I think it's, it's, there doesn't have to be a lot of extra text. Like it could, maybe it could even be a template page. Like it's like, here's a display IO, here are some display IO examples. If you want more help with display IO, go to the using display IO guide and here's a link. To yep. It. But otherwise here's, here's some code you know, getting the humidity values once every five seconds, and here's a screenshot, you know, and that's all, that's kind of all you need. And that's, yep. that it would speak for itself or something. So I think that's yep. a really good idea. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally agreed. And I think it makes great, great fodder as well for, for good first issues too, because it's like, there's loads and loads of different um, sensors out there. It's like, you know, almost kind of the same code for each of them. So once we get a couple, there's places to point people if it's their first time contributing um, and they can kind of have that as like a, something to be proud of to, to contribute. So yeah. I think it's um, good on that front as well. Aside from just having the examples, I think it's kind of beneficial for the community as well to have something to point towards for those good first issues. And if you see something, I mean, if there's some boilerplate that you see over and over again, maybe that should be a library or an addition to display text or something like that. I don't know, like to make it even easier. I mean, it might also kind of like going on or it might say like, okay, oh, well, here's one line. You want to display a label and some things. Here's how to make like a table or something like that. Or like that could be maybe interesting. Table. Maybe like a sub be a value table library or something like that. So I don't know. Yeah, or a sub a subclass of label or something that takes a sensor and then you just kind of feed it your sensor and it will keep itself hmm. up to date. Although you have uh, to keep calling update on it, yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. But I don't know. That's all right. That's down the line. So it's just it, yep. if you just find that like I'm copying and pasting a lot of code all the time. It's like that always says to me like, okay, what what abstraction can you create create here? Okay, all I right. will. Um, I will use this link and try to parse that out to get a good list of, um, I'll probably start with like accelerometers and temperature humidity sensors. Those are the ones that make the most sense uh, in my mind, but I'll branch out from there. So if anyone's got any other ideas or anything like that, or uh, if anyone does end up having input to the actual content of the issue, if we want to like boilerplate that out or include anything in specific in there before I go uh, and make them all, definitely um, feel free to ping me or reach out somewhere. Okay. 
All right. Thank you very much for that suggestion. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we'll um, we'll wrap up here. Um, well, this has been the Circuit Python Weekly for Monday, April twenty second, twenty twenty four. Thank you to everybody who participated or just hung out. We really appreciate uh, you taking an interest. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, please consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit. And the podcast will be available in major podcast services. Uh, this meeting will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers controllers newsletter, which comes out weekly. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. Um, the next meeting is at the regular time next Monday, 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time. Um, and it'll be right here on Discord, adafru.it slash Discord. If you want to be notified about this, uh, asked to be added to the at sign circuit pythonistas role on Discord. You can just uh, ask a moderator and we'll do, be happy to do that or ask during this meeting. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody. And I'll stop recording.